So we're now on to uh, module three. And so this is where we're going to introduce everyone to neural networks. So we introduced you to decision trees, um, which is technically the simplest approach to doing machine learning. And you know, putting together a bunch of decision trees is a random forest. So now that you've learned how to do one decision tree, it's, it's fairly easy to produce um, a random forest from that. Um, and as I'd mentioned, decision trees are, are perfectly fine. They're robust methods. Um, and when you use things like random forest and bagging and boosting, the decision trees function almost as well as, as some of the best machine learning techniques. And of course, the nice thing about decision trees is that they are interpretable. You can make sense from them. Uh, it's, it's how we think, it's how humans make decisions. Um, the neural networks are the basis to um, much of what machine learning is. And um, deep neural networks and variations on them are the foundation to, to most of modern machine learning. Uh, we're going to go to sort of a light version of neural nets because uh, the math is very complicated. Um, but it's to give you a flavor and an understanding, I guess, of how it works. Um, and uh, I guess we might as well start now. So we'll wrap this up in about an hour and a half, uh, and then we'll have another break uh, at half past uh, four in um, Toronto Eastern time, half past two uh, Western time, half past one California, and probably, I'm not sure where it is, uh, 10 in the morning, uh, 10 in the evening um, in the UK and Ireland. So when we think about neural nets, it's actually important to understand that the inspiration for neural nets came from our understanding of the biology of the brain. So I'm going to explain a little bit about how biological systems learn and then introduce the concept of neural nets um, and the early versions of neural nets that were developed in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the concepts related to neural networks, the one-hot encoding that we talked about, forward and back propagation, the concept of hidden layers. And we'll go through some Python code for an artificial neural net. And we'll apply the artificial neural net to uh, flower classification. So we saw how a decision tree could classify things. So we're just going to do the same thing, but to do flower classification with a more sophisticated neural net. And then we'll compare. So an artificial neural net, or an ANN, or a neural network for short, um, tries to simulate the activity of the brain. Um, and if you've seen pictures of the brain and cross sections and how people describe the wiring of the brains with neurons and dendrites and axons and everything else, it's this intense network connection. And you'll have an input typically, you know, you'll say, here's sound or visual information that goes through the neural network, and then there's an output. Um, what might be, you know, an interpreted image or an interpreted sound or something. So neural nets have uh, connected units, and instead of calling things neurons, we call them nodes or artificial neurons. And as I said, that's modeled like the neurons we know in the brain. And just like with um, you know, support vector machines and with uh, decision trees, you can do both classification yeah, or categorization and regression, which is curve fitting or linear fitting. And just so that you know that you know just about every problem in science can be broken down into either a classification or regression so even though we're saying oh classification regression that's just two narrow areas but um as i say just about everything um, in science can be broken down into like a regression or classification problem um the first descriptions of Artificial neural networks showed up in a, largely a textbook, I think, and then there were discussions that showed up a little bit before then, but the first one came out in 1986. Um, so it's only about 40 years old. Um, as I said, they try to mimic the way the brain works. They have layers of neurons connected to each other, and they perform pattern analysis and logic operations. What you're really doing 
from the computer side is you're converting you know, these nodes and connections to basically tables or matrices. So you can describe how A is connected to B and B to C and C to A through a table or through a matrix. And the strength of those connections um, also can be described as a table. You can also think of it as almost like a knowledge graph if some of you've worked with those. But again, they're connections and they're nodes. So on the left side, we're seeing a picture of a brain. On the right side, we're seeing sort of a digital representation of the brain. And in the lower image that we're seeing is a, a picture or stylized photorealistic image of a of a, a neuron working with electrical pulses going out or in along various um, axons or dendrites or neurite fibrils. And this is how information is passed from one neuron to another or one cell to another in your brain. And as you're listening to me or as I'm talking to you, these neurons are firing rapidly and you know, forming ideas and generating uh, muscle responses and other things that I can speak and for you guys to interpret. All of that can really be described in a connection diagram, which is shown here, um, which looks a lot like a neural net. So these are some drawings from uh, a brain slice. This is you know, before they had imaging. So this is done in the you know, probably 1800s, where they took a cortical layers and and drew out all of the cells. And one of the things that was noticed very early on is that the human brain, the cerebellum cortex, um, or the cerebral cortex, is made up of six layers of neurons. And you can kind of see that here. Uh, this is sort of the exterior kind of, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So they have you know, different densities of neuronal connections, but this is the structure of the human brain, uh, which sort of suggests that you know, maybe there's six layers of, um, or hidden layers in our brains. And that is sort of the, the sweet spot for uh, a neural net, if you wanted to do that. Each of them, as I say, they talk about cortical columns. You can look at them, so this is a cortical column uh, with certain, layers separated to reduce this, to reduce to that. Uh, they'll have uh, gray matter, they'll have white matter, and they um, structure each of these components. So again, there's structure within the structure within the structure, all of them connected. And of course, the brain is a very complex computer. So input for neurons typically comes in through dendrites, and those are electrical pulses um, precipitated by you know, calcium channel uh, flow. Um, and then those will converge into a cell body. The cell body does some calculations. We're not quite sure how it does, uh, but it'll integrate all of those inputs coming from the dendrites, and then that will be sent as an output through the axon. And so that axon then may you know, produce a muscle response or a visual response or um, activate another um, neuron. But what you're basically saying is you know, inputs, um, some kind of decision node in the center, and then outputs. And if you've got you know, billions of neurons in your brain, um, that's a lot of inputs and outputs. So the images and the understanding that we have is that neurons accumulate signals from other neurons. They integrate the input signals. And then if a threshold is reached, they fire. So if there's, you know, if you don't hear a sound, your brain won't think there's any sound. But if you can get past a threshold, then you'll hear a sound and then you might you know, look, turn to the source of that sound. Um, and of course, they'll propagate to different things. The brain will make some decisions whether you need to move toward the sound or move away from the sound or respond to the sound. And, you know, the upper diagram on the, on the right is showing, you know, diagrams of, of neurons. The lower one is essentially showing a computer version of that, where you have red and blue and green. 
neurons, and these are essentially nodes. And this looks a lot kind of like the decision tree. So we've got nodes and we have edges. Um, and the interaction between the nodes um, can be done to do things like addition and subtraction if you wanted to. Um, do it obviously more complicated. So with a brain, um, we can show the brain some partial images and your brain can go through a set of neural nets and fill in the missing pieces of these images. So on the left are some you know, uh, corrupted number eights, digital eights. And if you look long and hard enough at these things, you can probably figure out what, what parts are missing, but you could also say, what I'm seeing here in each, all six instances is a digital eight. What we're trying to do with artificial neural nets is the same thing, um, but with you know, mathematics and different numbers of layers, but we're gonna have a training set, we'll have input, hidden layers, and outputs. Um, so think of this blue part as the equivalent to a brain. And that's all we're trying to do with an artificial neural net. Now, with most artificial neural nets, there is usually only a single hidden layer. So this is output or input, output, hidden layer. So you can think of it sort of as three layers is what the conventional artificial neural net is. You could have four layers. But once you got to say more than four layers, what people found was that computers started bogging down. And especially in the 1980s and 90s, computers were not strong enough to do very deep neural network. And by the early 1990s, everyone has kind of just dropped the artificial neural nets. And we're sort of stuck at this. But with the development of GPU computers and more powerful CPUs, people basically said, well, let's see if we can go and build six and seven and 10 layer net networks. And it was just a curiosity thing. And that's what Jeffrey Hinton and uh, Joshua Benjo wanted to do. And, and what they found was that as they got closer to what really the human brain is like, the performance for these artificial neural nets, which they now call deep neural nets, got better. But you still needed huge amounts of computing. And this is why GPU computers are sort of essential to deep learning now. You just need a lot of horsepower to do uh, the training and the testing. So the concept of neural nets goes back um, more than 80 years. Uh, some color pets came up with the concept of a threshold logic neural model. The head model of a neuron um, appeared. Um, this was sort of developed by um, McGill in Montreal. Uh, the perceptron uh, developed in the late 60s. That was the first sort of artificial application of the want of something that was close to a neural net. Marvin Minsky in 1969 recognized that the perceptron could do logic, it could do and and or, but it could not do exclusive or. And so that's kind of where the field died. Uh, people came up with the concept of backpropagation, but they weren't too sure. And in 1986, Rummel Hart and McClellan published this book that used a combination of backward and forward propagation and the concept of artificial neural nets. And then by the late 2000s, when the computers got powerful enough, recurrent neural nets and deep neural nets uh, appeared, and that launched the field of deep learning. So that's sort of the neural network timeline. So if we go back to the McCullough and Pitts threshold logic, this is this um, 1943 model of sort of what you could do with a neuron, and they called it a neurode or node for a neuron. And they imagine that there's inputs, and this is trying to explain it biologically, um, that there's you know, two dendrites coming in with different weighted signals. They connect to the body of the neuron, and then they produce an output Y. So two Xs come in and you get a Y. The Y is the output. And they found that you could do you know, sort of thresholding logic if you had a threshold or if something was um, integrated appropriately through sort of a logistic or sigmoidal function. So you could do and and or, 
uh, functions. So and is 0 and 0 gives you 0. 0 and 1 gives you 0. 1 and 0 gives you 0. 1 and 1 gives you 1. That's, that's the logic of and. 4 is 0 or 0 gives you 0. 0 or 1 gives you 1. 1 or 0 gives you 1. 1 or 1 gives you 1. So those are the official Boolean and and or um, logic components. So that was the first concept. But then Donald Hebb, uh, who was a cellular biologist and sort of led a lot of the McGill uh, initiative in neurology, which McGill still sort of leads the world in, um, it had this concept of having greater strength applied to a, a, a given neuron. So if you give one input, the neuron will say, huh, that's not much. If you clobber it multiple times in image B, the neuron sort of takes the message. It gets this heavy activity. And so that leads to uh, a strengthening output. Um, and so that almost trains the neuron so that the next time you just have to give it a small stimulus, which is found in C, and then the output is much, much stronger than what you saw in A. So this idea of, of strengthening inputs or strengthening weights was something that was key because this is what they realized, this is how biology works. And they also understood that there was some metabolic or growth processes that take place, both for formation of memory, for the transmission of information or electrical signals. So that led to the concept of the Rosenblatt perceptron, or just called the perceptron, which is, OK, now we have inputs. They're weighted. Then you have to have some kind of sigmoidal thresholding function. And if something's below the threshold, nothing comes out. And if something's above the threshold, something comes out. But it's a function of the inputs and how much um, individual inputs are weighted. And it's a function of this integration function, which is sort of inside the, the node or the neuron. And that decides what the output is. So the nice thing about the perceptron was that it, it became both a, a mathematical and a computational model of a, a neuron. And uh, you have inputs, which are you know, x0, x1, x2, x3, and weights, w0, w1, w2. You have an input function that sums them. And then you have the activation function, which could be a step function, a sigmoidal function of some kind. And then you have an output. So the activation function, um, if you wanted a step function, uh, if the sum you know, is greater than 0, or it could be greater than 0 0.5, it gives you a 1. And it gives you 0 if it's less than 0 or less than 0.5. I mean, maybe I'll just make a change because I think the logic for this is. Just maybe also. OK, because I've never liked how that explanation came out. Because anyways, 0 0.5, um, and, and that's where you've got this threshold. So if it's greater than 0.5, you give 1. If it's less than 0.5, you give it 0. Um, so what you do with perceptron, and this is the other key advance, was that you, you know, take your inputs, do your net input, look at the activation function, take your output. But what if your output is wrong? So let's say instead of following this rule here, which is if it's greater than 0.5, say it's one, but in fact, it was actually greater than uh, 0.6 and it said it was zero, so it was wrong. So the output was wrong. How do you correct it? So you, know, you could taser it or you could, um, hit it, that doesn't make sense for a computer. So what you do is you calculate the error and you apply the error to your weighting functions. And so that that um, changes the input so that at least now your net input function is 
little higher. So the error between the actual output and the predicted output is then used to change the weights. And so the concept of a perceptron is to iteratively go back and adjust your weights until your output got to the point where it was what you expected or what you wanted. Um, and, and you can do this for different types of inputs and different um, sets of um, rules, but conceptually, this is the perceptron rule. And this is the essence, if you want, of the artificial neural net as well. So when the perceptron came out in the late 50s, everyone was excited because they sort of realized that this, this is probably how things work in our brains. Um, and as I said, this is the, the math, if you want, in terms of how the weights are changed and the weight uh, of each um, input node is modified by the difference between the expected and the predicted. Um, and um, you apply a learning rate, which is some function, um, uh, or an attenuating factor of the learning rate. And then we're also multiplying um, the predicted minus expected error with um, the, the input functions, which are x. So each of the weights is modified. And um, over time, you, you iterate until you get the output you want. Now, there are different types of activation functions. There can be step functions, sigmoidal functions, uh, linear functions. There is the alpha, that's the learning rate. Um, the target and actual output, that's T and Y. And then there's this weight of X, so we saw that. And then the activation function, which is the, the G of H, which is shown in red. So the perceptron learning rule, change in weights, eventually became a call the delta rule. And again, lots was written, lots was done with perceptrons. Um, and so when people uh, applied the perceptron to doing um, classification, they found that it could do pretty well. It could classify or perform N functions. Uh, they showed that it could classify, you know, groups that were between, you know, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0. So this is the and and or functions. Um, and that those thresholds were um, appropriate or sufficient. Um, but what also was realized is that it would only do um, separation or classification on sort of just simple linear combinations of inputs. And uh, it was a little more limited if you had um, more challenging logical functions. So the perceptron, as tested and as shown by Rosenblatt, it could do and and or functions. That's obviously useful for computing. Um, and what I'm showing here again is just sort of the calculation where if the sum is greater than zero or less than zero, you decide to, to produce an output. But what Marvin Minsky showed in 1969 was that the perceptron failed for one of the more important logical functions, which is called the exclusive OR function, or X OR. And it's showing sort of the classification is how do you separate the two black dots from the two white dots? And the only way you could do that is to have not just a single line, but sort of two lines or do some kind of kernel trick. But exclusive or is different than or. Remember that zero or zero gives you zero, zero, or one gives you one, one or zero gives you one, one or one gives you um, one. Um, X or one or, or one X or one gives you zero. So that's a, a difference. And it allows you to do things like performing logical difference or logical inequalities. So XOR is an important logic function and any modern computer needs to have it or performs it. But a perceptron couldn't do it. It could just do and, and it could just do or. 
And what people realized in the 1970s was that the only way you could get exclusive ore to work is if you had not just one layer, which is what the perceptron, but if you had two or more layers. And so that was a curiosity, but it was um, from 75 to 86 where people said, okay, maybe we can do a bit more with this. And that led to sort of the, the genesis of artificial neural nets, where the perceptron was extended to have another layer or two. And then, of course, with the deep neural nets, it became many layers. So the multi-layer perceptron or neural net was an extension of the perceptron. It had multiple layers, but that mimicked more the structure of the brain. Uh, so neural nets have to have three layers. Um, as we showed before, an input layer, a hidden layer, an output layer. You can have more than one hidden layer. But with multiple layers, you're able to do exclusive OR, you're able to do Boolean OR, and you're able to do Boolean AND. And instead of sort of the simple weighted function that the perceptron had, which we showed sort of the math, you had to do something a little more sophisticated, which is called back propagation. And it was, you know, talked about in the 70s, re revived and rediscovered in the 1980s. And that really represented the launch of machine learning. So there's a video I'm going to show you guys, which um, was posted on YouTube a number of years ago. Um, and it's, I think, very educational. Um, it's also done by a Canadian. Um, and I'll play it now. What's a neural network? A neural network is a type of program that learns how to do things instead of being hand programmed to do things. It's inspired by the neural networks in your brain. Your brain contains around 100 billion cells called neurons. These neurons have dendrites, which they use to receive signals from other neurons, and axons, which extend outward to send their own signals to other neurons. When a neuron receives the right mix of signals on its dendrites, it then sends out its own signal on its axon. A neural network in a computer is similar. Here's a very simple one, one that I've written actual code for. It has an input layer and an output layer. There's also a layer in between called a hidden layer. These circles represent the neurons found in your brain. Sometimes they're called neurons here too, but most often they're just called units. To keep the number of units small to fit in this video, I've trained it for something that doesn't need a lot of inputs or outputs. I've trained this one to count. It can count from zero to seven in binary. I could have made it count in decimal, but that would have been boring. If I set the input units to all zeros, then I've taught it to set the outputs like this, 001. That's the number one in binary. If I give it 001, it outputs 010. That's the number two in binary. It does that all the way up until you give it a seven in binary, which is 111. If you give it seven, then it outputs zero. But the fun thing to do is to give it zero to start with. And from then on, you simply take whatever it outputs and feed it back into its inputs. It just keeps on spitting out zero to seven and then keeps repeating, it counts. I've actually embedded the trained neural network into a web page, which I'll talk more about later. Here I give it a two and it spits out a three. And here I tell it to start counting from zero, zero, zero on its own. How do we teach the neural network? When we give it some inputs, some magic has to happen with all the stuff in here that makes it spit out what we want at the outputs. Each connection here has a number associated with it called a weight. There's also something else called a bias unit that has some value, and that's connected to the hidden units and output units, and its connections also have weights. So to get the neural network to produce outputs, we'll take the input values, do math with all these numbers, and if all those numbers are just right, it'll spit out the outputs we want. And all those numbers will, at the same time, be such that it will spit out the correct outputs for all possible inputs. So training a neural network involves adjusting all those weights, such that given an input, after doing all the math, it spits out the correct output. To train it to do that, we use something called the back propagation algorithm. It's called that because first we go one way through the network from input to output, and then propagate back from output to input, adjusting things. We start by making up what's called a training set. The training set consists of the inputs and what we expect as output for each input. So if we give it input 000, we want something close to 001 at the output. For 001, we want something close to 010, and so on. We'd normally give it the first set of inputs from the training set, 000. 
but that will give us very boring numbers to look at, mostly zeros. So let's assume we've already done some and are on the seventh input, one, one, zero. At the start of training, all the weights are just random numbers. I won't go through all the math in detail, but we take the values from the first input unit, a one in this case, multiply it by this first weight going to this hidden unit and store that in the hidden unit. We do the same for all the other input units that are connected to that hidden unit and add their results in too. We also multiply the value of the bias unit by its weight and add that to the hidden unit's value too. We then adjust that using an activation function that among other things, adjusts that to be between zero and one. We go across and do the same for all the hidden units. Those values for the hidden units are now the inputs. We're doing the same with all these weights and this bias unit and its weights. And once we've adjusted the results using the activation function, we finally have the outputs. And the first time we do all this, those outputs are likely nonsense. Now we need to go back through the network and adjust all those weights, such that we'll get a better result the next time. But we have to do it gently because we'll also be adjusting those same weights to work with other inputs too. Remember, our training set included both the possible inputs and the expected outputs. Using the expected output for the input we just used, we can calculate the errors for the outputs. In other words, just how far off were those outputs? We then use that error to go back through the network, adjusting the weights by very small amounts so that we'll get a smaller error the next time we give it that input. And that's why we call it the back propagation algorithm. We propagate back through the network, adjusting weights. We repeat that whole process for all the inputs and outputs in the training set. And once we've done that for the whole training set, we then repeat it a few thousand times until the error we start getting is very small, small enough that we consider it trained. For this neural network, I have to go through the training set around 680,000 times to get the RMS error to under 0 0.0005. Okay, um, did anyone have any questions about that? Because I think it's actually a very useful video. Okay, no questions, then we'll go on. Um, anyways, with the development of neural nets, um, people started to realize that they could um, do more than just sort of Boolean logic. They could actually become what are called universal function approximators. And to be able to do things like distinguishing or classifying data that's not linear separable, so doing exclusive or, but also doing um, advanced um, regression. So this, again, is the, the architecture. There's the input layer. It could be one node, two nodes, four nodes. A hidden layer also could be any number of nodes. And then an output layer, which could be one node, two nodes, usually not a lot, but it doesn't always have to be a single output. Layer. So there's terminology, as you heard with that video. There's hidden layers. And so those are the layers, the collections of nodes between the input and the output. Um, and they're the ones that help make connections uh, between input and output, but they're also the ones that allow more complex, if you want, logic or algebra or functions to be generated. The forward propagation, that's the first step in learning, where the sample input is put into the network, and you go through the, the multiplication or the weights that are applied to each of the nodes, the thresholding and activation uh, as, as the data is passed through. So that was what was shown in the, in the video. The back propagation is sort of the key thing, um, which is how the um, it learns from experience. And it, it makes errors, and the errors are used to correct um, the um, weights um, and biases of the layers. And it moves from one layer to another layer to another layer backwards. So that's why it's called back propagation. You saw the term epoch. epoch. Um, this is the number of samples or the number of times that you're used to train the neural net. Um, one iteration of training is considered one epoch. And so we learned about the 650,000 epochs that were done um, to train that neural net with that video. Um, you can do a variety of training methods. You can um, work with a single batch. You can work with mini batches. You can work with the whole thing. Um, but with batch learning, which I think has been found to be generally more efficient, you take the whole training set 
and break it up into batches. Um, so one epoch represents the training on all the batches uh, or on that initial training set. Um, by doing things like batch learning uh, or mini batch, you can update weights more frequently and that can speed up um, the learning process and make it more efficient. So this is a, an animated GIF, uh, which is probably a little hard to follow, but what, what you're saying is initially there's the inputs, which is the Xs, there's the um, um, hidden layers, there's hidden layer one, hidden layer two, and then there's an output layer. So this is a four layer neural net. Um, you're seeing how there are some functions, um, which are functions of the weights, weight of x. Um, and so you've got subscripts, um, x1, w14, w25. These represent the positions of the different nodes. Um, you can see F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. So those are where the numbering comes from. But then the connections between four and six, or five and six, or two and five, you'll get a WT5, W26, W46, W56. Um, so the arrows uh, will have weights. Uh, those are the numbers that you saw in the video. And they'll have, um, they actually represent table or matrix elements. So. If you're familiar with the table or matrix, it'll be you know, W15, W12, those are positions um, in, a, in a table or a matrix. Y is the output. Um, you'll see some combinations. So we're propagating data forward. We find the error between the predicted values and actual values. Use the error to change the weights and biases to reduce the error. That's the general A and N. Forward propagation takes the weighted sums of those inputs and applies the activation function. So that could be the sigmoidal function, it could be a soft max function, it could be a step function. Uh, so the output of the activation function is then propagated to the next layer. So that's sort of illustrated in this um, GIF, um, but I say it's a little hard to follow. The back propagation is the is the harder one, and you recall the delta rule, which is to say that which was in the perceptron. So we're doing the delta rule for back propagation. The output error is we get the actual error and the actual output, you know, compare the observed to predicted. Um, so we determine the error, and then we look at how that error has affected or would affect the previous errors, and then that error, which is going backwards, goes back to the next layer. And so you're seeing the animation. So there's the error in the first one, second layer, third layer. And it's those, those purple modes that are getting affected or altered. And that difference and how those differences are calculated um, is shown in, in this animated GIF. Um, so we multiply the error by the weight matrices of the previous layer. And delta here is the derivative of the cost function. Um, so the cost function sometimes is similar to something called cross entropy. Um, and the math again gets a little complicated. Um, the cost function um, is something that can be, you can calculate a derivative with. And when you can calculate a derivative, you can use a minimization approach called gradient descent. And um, by you know, looking at your cost function, being able to calculate a derivative, you can say, um, should the weights be increased or should the weights be decreased? And you might have watched in the video um, how some numbers went up and some numbers went down. Um, and so again, depending on whether the slope or the derivative you calculated based on your cost function uh, is, is changing or determining whether the weight goes up or down. So gradient descent, as I said, is a standard optimization protocol. Um, calculating derivatives is something we do in calculus. And this is part of what's used in artificial neural nets. So 
I think already you can see that artificial neural nets mathematically are much more complicated than decision trees. We're using you know, gradient descent methods, we're using you know, partial derivatives, the chain rule, impartial derivatives. Uh, we're using this concept of back propagation and using multiple layers, multiple weightings. Um, so it's it's because of the mathematical complexity that also requires that the data itself be carefully transformed and scaled and normalized. And that's something we talked about. So with decision trees, we didn't have to worry about that really, but with neural nets, we do all again because the math is significantly more complex. So with the the deltas, the derivatives that we found earlier, we can then find the derivative of the cost function with respect to the weight matrices. So this is where we're deciding whether we add or subtract. And so now you can see that the, um, the cost function, which is delta, we're also doing derivatives of the activation function. That's the sigmoidal function or soft max function. Uh, we're adding weighted sums and we're including the, um, the y, which is the output from each neuron and moving those weights back up. So you can see that the weight of the new 1,4 node um, or the new 2,4 node or the new 3,4 node equals the old weight minus this learning rate, which is the eta, the delta, which is the derivative of the cost function and the derivative of the activation function times the output of each neuron. Um, so again, the math is complicated. And how things are affected is again decided by learning rates, which we saw for the perceptron, deltas, which we saw with the perceptron, um, and then the derivative of the activation function, which we didn't see with the perceptron. And then we can subtract the weights all the way back um, to um, from the first layer to the second layer to the third layer to the input weights. And eventually those updates uh, applied. And then the cost or the difference between the output and observed output and the desired output gets minimized. So I don't know if globally, if it makes sense. I mean, part of the, the idea was the video, part of it is trying to introduce you to the perceptron, which is a simpler concept. And then to highlight the fact that what we're trying to do is use derivatizable functions like sigmoidal functions or soft max functions. Uh, notice we don't use step functions. Um, and that we're applying these differences, the cost function, which is the, how, how close you are to the desired output um, and how we're weighting that desired output uh, to change the weights on all of the connections to the nodes. So what we're doing effectively um, is we're sort of changing um, the steepness of these activation functions, which in most cases is sort of the sigmoidal function. So it's just like biologically, you can think about um, the, the model of, of the neurons where you, you know, stimulate it actively and then it becomes more responsive. But then if you um, dial it back, then it becomes less responsive. And, and that's sort of the steepness of the activation function. So by increasing weights, we make this activation function steeper, more like a logistic function or a step, step function. If we reduce the weights, then it becomes more like a linear function. And so that's essentially all that's happening, at least visually. We can also add bias, and so we can shift it from instead of having a, you know, a zero point, we can shift the bias so it's closer to minus five or plus five. Um, that bias um, can help um, sort some things out. It's again, it, it's, um, if you think about it for the brain, it would be, you know, everyone has a, a threshold to which they can hear. So some people can hear it to 10 decibels, some people can hear it 20 decibels, some people can hear it 30 decibels. That's their bias. And so that's um, a shift in their activation function. But everyone 
once they hear something, will have the same response. And so that's the uh, reflected in the uh, sigmoidal function. The learning rate, that's eta, um, is it's typically a number between zero and one, and it's um, sort of reflects the rate at which weights and biases are changed. So you can have tiny little steps going down as part of your optimization function, and that's on the left side. You can have giant leaps, which is shown on the far right side, and you can have jumps that are you know, first large, but then progressively smaller as you get right down to the minimum. So this is also how we describe gradient descent functions to, to find the optimization or optimal rate. Um, and, and so um, that's partly related to the gradient descent concept, but also uh, to make it uh, more consistent um, when learning is done. Um, I sometimes use this as a way of illustrating artificial neural nets, um, where we start with an input, and you can think of things as an array of, um, where you have to have a certain combination of weights and or um, matrices. So if there's an input array of zero, one, it's a one by two array, that means it would have to be connected to a, another array, minimum of two units, but maybe you can make it larger. So in this case, this is a two by three array. Um, that will produce a set of weights, but then that also has to be applied to another weight matrix. Um, and that array has to be a set number so that in this case, if our output is only going to you know, go from a one by two array, if we just want an output of a single number, that means we have to have a three by one array in terms of weightings. So the numbers in these matrices or arrays are what were changing. Those are the weights, and they're changed um, as part of the backpropagation approach. But we're, in this case, using uh, logistic activation function or a sigmoidal activation function, and we're deciding whether, in this case, you know, 0.13 is sufficiently close to zero or not. And the activation function may say, no, it's not. So then that decides the error that's then propagated back through these weight matrices. So as we back propagate, we change the error based on the difference between the output and desired output and the observed output. And we change it using this combination of the learning rate, the cost function that specific to the system, the derivatives of the activation function. In this case, that's the sigmoidal function. And numbers get changed when we recalculate and we see, you know, are we any closer? Um, you know, we call it, we had one that was 0.13, now we're with the new net weights, we're now at 0.062. Um, and maybe that was good enough. Then we can try a new input for another epoch, another batch. Uh, we start off with 0.084, but we desire one. So we go back, propagate, change the weights again. Um, and eventually we get something that converges. So the net result is these weight matrices, um, which is, um, as shown in the uh, video, were those numbers assigned to the edges in the, in the network. But in reality, the way that the math is done, the edge information is in these tables of weights. Same sort of thing here. This is another example where we've got an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. We have some inputs of one and one is the input layer. The connections between the input and the hidden layer, so that's a two by one, then there's going to be a two by three um, matrix. So that's going to be six values. Those are the numbers that are shown here. So that's the weight matrix. So one by two array, two by three array. And then we have a three by one array, which is this. So these are the weights. These are the weights. The, this is the input. And then this is the output is 0.73. Um, so we have the input. Here's the output. We compare the output. We prop back propagate. So we want to look at these numbers as the back propagation is done. And then we want to look at 
uh, the error. So the error here is 0.54. We back propagate. Now the error dropped down to 0.5 from 0.54, but you'll notice that the numbers changed. So just go back, forward, back, forward. You can see how the numbers changed. You go again, this is iteration 30. The, iterate, the error is smaller. The numbers are changing some more. Iteration 40, and you can see the error is getting smaller. Error is getting smaller. You can see that the output, which used to be 0.73, has been shrinking, shrinking, and it eventually got down to 0.01. Um, and this ticks 60 iterations, and you can see how these weights have all changed, um, especially from when they were at the first iteration. Those weights are the things that are being altered through the back propagation. Those weights can be modeled as a matrix, just like I showed earlier, as a one by three or two by three or one by two array. Does that make sense to everyone? So I think, Tiffany, did you have a question or is that a thumbs up saying it makes sense? Oh, I just have a quick question. <laughs> sure. Um, I guess, depending on if you're, I guess, creating a new neural network, what matrix of values do you begin with? Or is there any logic in designing the initial matrix? You just start with random numbers and we'll show you in the, the code for this. But yeah, everything is just initialized with some random numbers. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, any other questions? I think one is being written in the Slack right now. Yeah, uh, I I have a question regarding uh, the back propagation because yeah. I uh, if you're going to talk further about that, it's okay. But I don't understand how like because do they like it's I don't really understand how. Uh, they achieve like they choose which number and do they check all numbers to see like if if it's the the one because i think i understand that it's the one with the like least uh change to achieve the result i'm not sure i understand exactly uh so if i'm we can look at um, this set again, and it's just useful. Just look at this number 0 0.1, 0 0.18, and just see how it's changed as we go from iteration zero, iteration 10, so it went from 0.18 and it became negative. Iteration 30, it dropped precipitously. Iteration 40, it's starting to flatten out a bit. Iteration 50, it's about minus 20 and settles at minus 24. So it went from a positive number to a very, very negative number. Um, so the, the process by which some of these numbers change um, is, is partly a function of how much some of the other weights have changed and by how far off your result is. So remember our desired result is, is zero. So we want one, one is the input, the output, the desired output should be zero which is close. And what you're seeing, as I say, so this is a real neural net in the sense that these were numbers that were taken from a real thing and calculated. But um, so these, if you want, these are random numbers um, in these hidden layers. Mm -hmm. And that's the output, that's the input. And as it went through these different iterations, um, you can see that the, the way that these things change is not um, perfectly linear. Uh, some climb faster, some drop faster. Um, and that is a function of either the, the cost function that you're using, the learning rate, um, the activation um, function. So with this one, I don't know, they were probably using um, a sigmoidal one. Essentially, what I'm asking is, like, 
what does an iteration look like? Like, what does the computer do within an iteration to choose what number gets changed? So all of the numbers are changed. Um, so in this one iteration, this, this is iteration 59. If we look at iteration 58, which I don't have, but all of the numbers would be different between iteration 59 and 58. So these numbers would be different. These numbers would be different. They'd be subtly different, but they'd all be different. So that's one, if you want, epoch. So these iterations or epochs are, are where all of the weights are changed through the bat propagation step. Okay. So uh, say we, we've only selectively chosen I don't know, six or seven different iterations rather than all 60 iterations. But the point was just to show that these numbers, all of them are changing. All of them are changing because you know, this was off. So we wanted a desired output of zero. Um, that meant that we were off by 0.73. I don't know how they came up with an error of 0.54, but whatever. That's the error. That magnitude of the error affected these three. And these three sort of talked to each other. This error then affected how these were changed. And then we went through a forward propagation and said, okay, now that we've got these new weight matrices, let's put the input in, run it through the, the weight calculations, and then see if we get something closer to zero. And so we did that. And let's pretend this is just iteration two. Now we dropped from 0.73 to 0.5. But you can see these numbers are all now different. Um, so we, we do another forward propagation after we done a back propagation. So the back propagation changes these. The forward propagation runs through the weight matrix calculations to see what number we get here. So it dropped a little bit here. It dropped quite a bit here. So you can see that between here and here, there's a big drop. And you can see that this node stabilizes at minus 28. It stabilizes that way all the way through. But you can see that this node is changing quite dramatically. Um, you can see that this node at 17 suddenly jumps up at 42. So this seems to be the key node or the key weight that allowed things to drop. So you can still think of it as it's almost like a minimization search, which is where the gradient descent comes in. You're trying to find which of these weights or which combination of weights allows you to get you know, stuck, uh, unstuck from this 0 0.5, 0 0.49, 0 0.5, suddenly down to 0.24, and further down to 0 0.05. So does it like evaluate for like gradient descent type thing? Between each layer, yes. Uh, okay, I I think I understand now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um. So let's Before actually move on. Sorry, I think there are a couple more hands up. I'm oh, okay. just get sure. to the question. Uh, Tiffany, go ahead. I think my question was actually just answered, but I'll just ask it just in case. So you had said some of the weights can be um, fixed after they've reached their minimum cost. Is that right? So like, it's not just a totally random change at every weight, every time it's propagated, like some of them can That's right. It's, it's, okay. a, it's a directed move. So okay. like you can see, look at the top one. Mm -hmm. We start off at minus 0.99. It moved a little bit to minus 4.11 and then shot way down to minus 28. Mm -hmm. But then it stayed at minus 28 for all the other iterations. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Okay. Thanks, um, and Rachel, go ahead. Hi, thanks, sorry. I think it's a question probably along the same lines again. So so I understand that the, the numbers that are the weights 
just at the very beginning are random. And then I understand that you go through the back propagation until the result gets closer to what you want. So do you, and is the numbers that you then change the weights to as you do those iterations, are they based on the scary mathematical gradient descent type things you were talking about? That's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it all starts, and this is why they call it propagation. It starts with this one. It's, you know, how far off are you from your desired output, which was you know, zero, I think, was the desired output. Um, and so you're wanting a, you know, one, one and one equals zero. Um, I think that's an exclusive or function, right? Um, so you're wanting to do exclusive or, and um, as I said, we started out with these random weights at the beginning. So these are just random numbers. Um, and the result was pretty lousy because that's closer to one than it is to zero. And yeah, so big error, that big error then transmits more emphatically to this layer, but then that still has issues and those changes also propagate back to this layer. So that's what we can see. We just pretend this is iteration one or so. These ones changed, um, maybe not so dramatically. And some went to, from positive to negative. Uh, but you can also see that those iterations then changed some of these. And this one changed, I think, the most at the top. And so, you know, this was the guilty party that was either identified by the cost function and the gradient. And then it continues as we iterate. But each time it has to go through the forward propagation so that you, you know what the output is, so that you can calculate that error. So then you can go and do the back propagation. And then once the back propagation, then you forward propagate to say, what is the new number? And we do that and went from 0.5 to 0.49. So that wasn't too productive, but you know, it propagates back again. And it's still trying to find which of these weights is sort of the secret weight. And you know, this one stabilized, but as you went on, this one changed dramatically. And this one also changed dramatically. And that suddenly got you out of your rut or your local minimum. And now you're heading closer and closer to, to zero. And at this point, it's pretty much zero. And now we have an exclusive OR function. One XOR, one XOR gives you zero. Thank you. OK. Any, okay. any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, I do want to point out that Tanvir has put some really good resources on gradient descent in the Slack, if anyone's interested in going deeper on that. Okay, great. So um, we're going to try this. Uh, as I say, instead of decision trees, we're going to use neural nets. So we're going to use the same thing with irises. We're going to get our data set. We've seen this picture before. We've been in this rodeo before. Um, so in this case, we're going to have a, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So we're going to have a subset of 150, and it turns out it's going to be 105, just like we did with the uh, decision tree. And then we're going to have our test set of 45. Um, so the data is just like what it was before, and that's what the data one CSV looks like. And so we're going to program it. And rather than making you guys code it in less than 15 minutes, um, we've got the code ready for you. So this is in now in module three. And if you want, you can open it up or you can just look at the slides right now. Um, so we'll open the Colab file. Now the general algorithm um, is just like it, the, the decision tree. We read the data, we check the data. Uh, we create the training and testing data sets. So the same code is used there. But because this is not a decision tree, we have to do one hot encoding. Um, and so we have to write a function. It's called to one hot. And we've talked about one hot encoding. Also, because it's not a decision tree, we have to normalize the data. And this is key. And we talked about that in module one. 
So we create a normalization function. And so then we normalize the data. And then we do the one-hot encoding with our two one-hot function. We also have to define our activation function. Um, I think we use a softmax function for this one. Then we have to you know, create our weights and biases. So that's the random number stuff to fill our, our matrix. And then we're going to do some batch learning. So we decide on how many batches. And so now we've got our matrix set up. We've got our weight set up. We've got our activation function, our activation function set up. So then we can do the forward propagation. So that's that, you know, sort of the matrix algebra. Then we calculate the error that was between the output and the input, or the desired output and the calculated output. Then we perform the back propagation, and then we update the weights and biases. And we continue that until we reached a, a minimum with our loss function, and then we're done. So this is stuff we've seen before that we import uh, NumPy and we import pandas, but we also import two other things. One is Seaborn and Matplotlib. And these are two functions that you can get from Python. And this is for data visualization. And we'll, we'll use some of that, I think, in this one or maybe the next one. So, you know, reading in the data, this is what we saw before. So this should be um, just like we saw before. This is uh, the data check, and we have the verifying to make sure there's no missing data. And that's just like we saw before. And then we're going to do this data transformation and feature selection. So again, we saw this. We're going to have uh, two thirds signed for training, and one third for testing. So that is the same code that we used for the um, uh, Iris decision tree. Now we're going to do the one hot encoding. So um, this was um, how we convert um, a Satosa is going to be 100. A Virginica is going to be 001. And Versicolor is going to be 010. So not too hard. And we saw how one hot encoding can be done, but it's three categories. And so we're converting it into sort of a binary one. OK. So we do this one hot encoding function. Uh, it can take um, you know, categorical variables and we'll calculate um, whether things are going to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And that's how we one hot, our calculator one hot encoding one. Um, we're going to do normalization. And this is because the flower dimensions range from you know, roughly 0 0.3 centimeters to I think about up to almost 10 centimeters. That's a fairly large range in numbers. So we have to do what's called an L2 normalization uh, so that we have the sums, sum of squares adding up to one. This is often done in neural nets or any deep learning. Try and change your values if they're numerical into something that's roughly between zero and one. Um, and that way it, it sort of um, makes sure that the some of the extreme values aren't overwhelming the smaller values or more frequently seen values. Um, so we're separating that into the input and output data as well. Um, and then we call that normalized function. So we're normalizing sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Uh, this is where we're encoding um, for um, species. So this is label encoding. This is not the one hot encoding. Um, and uh, now this is we convert those 0, 1, 2 to the one hot codings, which is the you know, 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. Uh, we've got some features. Um, this is something later. So this is just, you could use this for exercises, but we can turn off features and turn on features, um, which is feature selection if you want. So um, we've already started transforming the data. We've selected the features. We're using all the pedal widths and sequel links and everything else. We're obviously choosing the, the artificial neural net. 
So with the artificial neural net, we have to just define our activation function. Now we can use two different functions. Um, so for layer one, which is just sort of a, um, a simple yes, no, or categorical type decision thing, we can use the sigmoidal function. Um, and this is the um, character of a sigmoidal function. Um, it's um, also called a logistic function. It's how people do things like logistic regression or categorization using a differentiable function. Um, and having a differentiable function is really important because you can do gradient descent, uh, which is an optimization thing. And that's just how we're minimizing the error between the predicted and the actual output. So this is just to remind people that the sigmoidal function is used to do um, binary classification or categorization, zero, one, yes, no. A soft max function is a more complex version of the sigmoid function, and it's used to do categorization of three or more things, or when you're dealing with three or more entities, say in terms of a, a scoring matrix. So we're using sigmoid for, I think, um, layer one, and I think we use a soft max for layer two. Um, so as I said, for multi-class, you know, three or more variables, um, we use a soft max function. And because we've got three types of flowers um, instead of two, um, and it's the same thing with uh, secondary structure, we have three types of secondary structure with proteins, alpha helix, beta sheet, coil. We'll see softmax used later on uh, when we use neural nets for secondary structure prediction. So in this case, um, with the input layer, it's we use sigmoidal. And for the output, because we're predicting three states, we use a softmax function. So uh, we have to start our model. So this is where we randomize. So there's your random function. Uh, so we're putting in random values for our weights. We're putting random numbers for our biases. And the biases are for the hidden. Um, weight zero is between input and hidden layer. Weight one is for hidden and output. And there's our biases. This is where we're trying to decide how many batches we're gonna use. Um, and uh, this is just to make sure that we're um, producing a, an even number uh, that is uh, not going to leave us with a remainder that's not zero. And this is the, the concept of the, the loop. So what we do is for batch one, let's say it's 30 flowers, um, we're going to first do a forward propagation. And we have our output and our desired output. We calculate the error between them. We do a back propagation all the way through, which then up, updates all the weights and biases. Then we go to batch two, same thing. Batch three, same thing. All the way to batch n. So this is done because it's 105 training flowers. Uh, we might do, I don't know, three or four batches. That is one epoch. And then you start again. So it's just a little more efficient for training. Um, we have to have a learning rate. We have to have batch size, number of epochs, training sets, and then we output the weights and biases for the hidden layer. And so these are the things that come out in neural net out error measurements. So the forward propagation is sort of just basically, um, you know, that matrix multiplication, if you want, um, applying the um, bias functions, applying the activation functions. Um, and that's indicated here with this dot product, applying the sigmoidal propagation function. Layer two, uh, which is where we're trying to get the three classes, we use the softmax function. We then calculate our errors. Again, just remember the algorithm I talked about. Um, so we compare the true output to the desired output or the calculated output to the desired output. Um, we use our 
derivative, which is the cost function. And then we subtract um, to this gradient descent. Turns out that we don't really have to do partial derivatives, that this is turning out to be um, a difference as opposed to a derivative. Um, this is the complicated math uh, that we saw before. So we're using gradient descent, we calculate a derivative of the cost respect to the weights. And we call that the delta for layer two. And then there's a bias for layer two. And we can go from layer two. So there's, I guess, I'll just make sure. From layer two to layer one, and then from layer one to layer zero. And again, there's the weights, there's the derivative, there's their cost function. Um, this is the calculation that's there. And we're just showing layer two, layer one, layer zero. So we went from layer two to layer one, layer one to layer zero. Our black propagation. And again, more math, more derivatives, more cost functions. Um, and so this allows us, uh, once all those back propagations have been done, um, we can apply these to the weight matrices. And so we can update all the weights um, on each of those um, matrices that are in our scoring set, our weight matrices. We also not only have to update the weights, we have to update the bias functions. So this also is applied here. Um, and as I said, it's forward propagation, um, error calculation, back propagation, um, and then forward propagation back and again. So all of these things um, show it with a batch, propagate to the first layer, propagate to the second layer, error calculation, derivative calculation for layer two, derivative calculation for layer one, layer one now error calculation, layer one and layer two, and then update your biases and repeat and repeat and repeat. What we're doing is we're also tracking the error as we go through the epochs. And this is shown in the video where you wanted to see the errors start dropping and dropping and dropping. And eventually as of the number of epochs, and so he had like 650,000 epochs, we don't need as many, um, but it starts flattening out. And at this point, when we see it flattening out, that's either when we can draw a line and say, we've trained enough. So this is much more complicated, both the math and the number of steps and algorithmically. So compared to the decision tree, the number of lines for this one is about 215. It's still just as fast as the decision tree. So we train on data every time, it takes a second. We run it, it takes about two seconds. Um, so, um, since it's fast, we're, you know, we're not separating the training step and saying, oh, it's all trained and we're going to have to train again. We're just letting it train each time. So what you do is, you know, you, you've, um, got this thing working. It's, it's optimized. It's found, it seems to be a good model for the 105 flowers that we used as our um, our test set, our training set, and now we can um, test it on the um, test set. Um, and so uh, we're just going to take the training uh, function output and test it as, as the input. So we're going to evaluate the test set and, and propagate forward. So we can get some numbers and in the case of the training data with this neural net, this is the um, graph that we compared. And um, remember from our last one with the decision tree, we wanted to see one, one, one diagonally and zeros all the way. And in fact, that's actually got with the training set with the decision tree. With this neural net, it's not quite as good, at least with the training set, but in terms of the testing set, it's actually slightly better. So recall with the testing set with the decision tree, we had, I think it was 0 0.07 um, and 0 0.93.
So with this one, in terms of our confusion matrix, uh, the performance with the neural net is slightly better. But what I want to also emphasize is that, you know, the decision tree um, mathematically was a lot easier. Maybe more of you would have understood it. The artificial neural net is really tough math. And um, it's not even clear if any of us fully understand some of the math with it. Um, but um, the performance is not that much better. And that's what I wanted to point out. And this is where there's a lot of um, unfortunate, um, I guess, bias or discrimination where people feel that decision trees just don't cut it. And the answer is uh, no. I mean, a random forest can be just as good as any neural net or in some cases, any good deep learning tool if you've done a good job of training and appropriate you know, management of the data. Likewise, you have to remember with the neural net, we had to do all kinds of things like we had to do one-hot encoding, we had to do normalization with L2 norm. Uh, we have to worry about all these derivatives. Whereas, so it's, it's a mystery how it works. It's a mystery why these weights are as they appear. Whereas with the decision tree, we can say, oh, it's the sepal width that's the most important and then petal length is the next most. And that's how you can make a nice decision tree. So I, I, I prefer decision trees, <laughs> frankly, at many levels. Um, but this is what we wanted to show you guys and to show you the gory details of what real neural nets are about. And this is a simple neural net. So you can imagine the math, but you wanted to do something that was much more complicated. So as I say, we're just comparing the iris decision tree with the artificial neural net. And basically it's a tie. You can say iris ANN is a little bit better. Um, we've said, and we've done the program both in R and in Python. And this case is impressive. R actually didn't need as, uh, as many lines of code as we expected and also seemed to run quite quickly. So that was a pleasant surprise for us because sometimes we see our code is up to 10 times slower than Python. So what we have is now a neural net program uh, that predicts iris flowers. Um, and just like we did with the decision tree, it's pretty generic. So you could do it just like other classification problems. And just like with the next part, we can probably do some uh, a few examples and, and run it. So what I'll do, because we only have about five minutes left, is just sort of introduce you to the lab it's just like the other lab before. We're now in module three. We're looking for the program called IRIS ANN, not IRIS DT4. And it can be the Python or the R, if you prefer. Uh, you upload the Go Google Colab stuff. Um, as I said, you can look at the code if you want. We've gone through it already, but some of you may be more interested in it now, given the complexity. And then we invite you to run it. Um, we're going to use exactly the same file, same approach. Click on the file folder, click on upload, choose data1.csv so that you can run that. And just like with the other one with the decision tree, you can do run all um, under runtime. And uh, you can see if things match. Now, with this, you can play around with the code. So um, in cell three, um, you can change the number of epochs. So you can go to more epochs or you can go to fewer. So we're suggesting try fewer epochs. And so your training hasn't quite converged and you'll see a different performance. Um, then you can run cells 13 through 16 to see what your confusion matrix. And what you'll find if you run it is that the versicolor samples start getting messed up. And so you can play around with just iterating on the different epochs. You can go from 100, you can go to 400, you can go to 600, and find which one produces the best results. And there's other combinations you could try. Um, so this is, as I say, it's a taste of uh, neural nets. Um, I'm going to go quiet now so that people can play around with the code and uh, sort of explore and see what you get.